Valentine Martin Lee and the very powerful Mr. Zhang Yuxi. The afternoon are entirely academic, non-partisan, multidisciplinary, and if I allow one more minute, they are not empty talkers. When I was in Hong Kong last year, I invite 12 academics with perfect credential because several academic journals invite me to guest edit special issue on HKSAR at 20. So I invite them and only 10 respond and at the end only 9 hand in their paper to the Ming Dynasty. <laughs> and then two of them caught up. So finally, I thought I had seven, but last minute another caught up. So the remaining survivor, six of them, are here today in two separate panels. And I'm delighted my colleague and another Hong Konger if somebody's feet are touching the cables on the bottom, if, bring the CIA, bring James Bond, don't bring me. I'm not even see at the table. Turn it off, turn it off. It shouldn't be the problem. Usually I was told that if people's feet are touching the cables. I don't think we need the microphone now, right? Now they need to take the card. Should be okay. Okay. Okay, shall we? Yeah, so professor, professor of East Asian Language and Culture and also the director of this Central Asian Study 10 years ago in Auckland, this series, so it's only befitting he chaired this first afternoon <coughs> panel. Well, thank you. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, this during the Ming Dynasty, you see, uh, everything runs differently. <laughs> On his way in, Ming just gave me this paper, this piece of paper, so I'm going to read this so that to introduce <laughs> Okay, so I got my job cut, clearly, no. Um, um, we have three speakers, each speaker will have 20 minutes, I believe, and then I hope that someone would show the time, or do I, should I? Justin. Ah, okay, great, thank you. So the first speaker is Professor Sunny Lo from HKU. The title is Ideologies and Factionalism in Beijing HK Relations Nationalism versus Localism. And Sunny Xiu Hing. Lo is Professor and Deputy Director of HKU Space and President of Hong Kong Political Science Association. With a PhD from University of Toronto, he worked at Education University of Hong Kong, University of Waterloo, University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, Murdoch University, Australia, Ling Nan College, Hong Kong, and University of East Asia, Macau. He wrote 11 single author books. His most recent edited, edited volume is Interest Groups and the New Democracy Movement in Hong Kong. Professor, please. PowerPoint people. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Sun, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my presentation topic is uh, ideologies and factionalism in Beijing-Hong Kong relations. Well, first of all, uh, since uh, 1997, especially after the mass protests on July 1st, 2003, ideologies and factionalism have uh, become the two major factors shaping the relationships between Hong Kong and the HKSAR. And here, for ideologies, I refer to nationalism, which can be seen as a strong belief and consciousness in patriotic allegiance, and localism, which can be seen as a strong sense of local identity and consciousness. And these two ideologies have been in conflict between uh, mainland China and the Hong Kong SAR. 
Now there are two major variants of uh, nationalism on the political spectrum. Uh, if you like, uh, with uh, pro Beijing side on one end, and the other end is uh, pro Hong Kong localism. So uh, here I construct a political spectrum from left to right, or, or from right to left, if you like. The first uh, type of uh, nationalism is uh, what I label as conservative nationalism. Is the ideology of having strong nationalistic sentiment but maintaining political, social, economic status quo, stressing the importance of one country, and it also shapes the dominant conservative uh, nationalist uh, faction since uh, 2014. So it seems to be that uh, since 2014, uh, the central authorities in Beijing has been dominated by this conservative nationalist uh, faction. The second liberal nationalism is referred to the, those uh, nationalists uh, who tend to have more open-minded and liberal outlook, shaping the 2010 compromise over political reform. So for those who are familiar with uh, Hong Kong, you may recall that in the summer of 2010, there was a compromise over political reform. Now, for the uh, conservative nationalists, uh, here I name some examples. Uh, Zhang Dezhang from Beijing, uh, L.C. Leung, and for liberal nationalists, uh, you know, here we, I name the Honorable Mr. Jasper Zhang. Well, of course, uh, from another angle, uh, there are several types of uh, localists uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, for the nationalistic localists, I would say this, this can be referred to, traditionally speaking, the so-called pro-Beijing elites and the masses in Hong Kong. Uh, one good example is the chair lady of the DAB, uh, Ms. Starry Lee. For the liberal localists, uh, they are those who tend to be liberal-minded, advocating the protection of civil liberties. Uh, and those uh, supporters of the Democratic Party and the Civic Party and recently, some of the younger generation members uh, can be seen as the liberal localists. For the Marxist uh, localists, uh, they are those who criticize the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region as an exploitative capitalist state with a dominant capitalist class. And if you like, uh, this, this can be seen as the uh, social democrats uh, in the West. Uh, the notable example is uh, long-haired gentleman and also Li Chap Yan. Um, there are also some action-oriented localists, uh, those localists uh, who use protests uh, and uh, unintentionally, you know, uh, violent uh, to make the demands heard. And some of them are the participants in the, in the early 2016 Mong Kok riots. So I would say the, um, the, the, the organizers of the Occupy Central movement, including the Professor Tai, uh, Professor Chen and Reverend Chu, they may be regarded as the action-oriented uh, or I label here as confrontational localists. For the separatist localists, uh, they are those who advocate Hong Kong's nationalism and independence. They rose up very quickly between uh, 2013 to 2016. The notable examples uh, are Mr. Chen Ho Ting, uh, the founder of the Hong Kong National Party, Yao Wai Cheng and Bak Jiu Lam, the two legislators elect. Uh, and now, with regard to uh, factionalism, there are several points. Uh, in the summer 2010, the liaison officer uh, discussed uh, with the Democratic Party over political reform. And here, the Beijing nationalists uh, tended to be more liberal, while the Hong Kong pro democracy faction was dominated by the liberal localists. Now, from 2014 to 2016, there appeared to be a change in the sense that Beijing faction on Hong Kong affair has been dominated by the conservative nationalists, while the Hong Kong pro-democracy factions uh, were dominated by the confrontational liberals. So, uh, in other words, uh, from 2014 to 2016, the political spectrum uh, became uh, polarized uh, on both sides. And factionalism shapes political, societal, legal, and economic disputes. As you can see from the table here, on political disputes, the conservative nationalists believe that Beijing intervention in Hong Kong is positive. The liberal nationalists, they try to keep 
intervention from Beijing minimal. For the nationalists, the localists, they advocate compromise between Hong Kong and Beijing and stress a moderate approach to reform. For the liberal localists, they advocate direct election of the CE without central government's control. For the Marxist localists, they advocate the direct election of both the CE and the LEFCO as soon as possible. For the confrontational localists, they use uh, confrontational tactics and perhaps even violence as necessary to push for political reform. For the separatists, uh, they perceive for Hong Kong as a nation. On economic disputes, conservative nationalists see integration between Hong Kong and China as natural and mutually beneficial. For the liberal nationalists, they see economic integration as interdependence. For the nationalist localists, they see integration as inevitable. For the liberal localists, they see integration as harmful to Hong Kong. For the Marxist localists, they see integration as the mainlandization of Hong Kong. And for the confrontational localists, they see integration as China's annexation of Hong Kong. And finally, for the separatist uh, localists, they seek independence uh, from China. For the societal disputes, the conservative nationalists, uh, they see social harmony and integration uh, as very important. Whereas the liberal nationalists, they stress uh, social harmony, they accept social pluralism and support in social integration. The nationalists, the localists, see national, national education as necessary and compatible with Hong Kong. For the liberal localists, they see national education as harmful and brainwashing Hong Kong students. For the Marxist localists, they call for more redistribution and tax reform, and they also reject uh, national education. For the confrontational localists, they see the society of Hong Kong as being flooded with mainland tourists and immigrants. For the separatist localists, they see Hong Kong culture as pure and unique, and such purity should ideally be maintained. On the legal disputes, uh, again, there are lots of differences among all these uh, factions. The conservative nationalists, they see NPC interpretation of the basic law as a must. Uh, for the liberal nationalists, they see NPC interpretation as uh, beneficial to Hong Kong. For the nationalists, the localists, they see NP NPC interpretation as inevitable. For the liberal localists, they see the NPC interpretation as harmful to Hong Kong. For the Marxist localists, they see the NPC interpretation as an authoritarian measure by the center. For the confrontational localists, they see the NPC interpretation as a totalitarian attempt by the center. And finally, the separatists, uh, of course, they see the NPC interpretation as absolutely a totalitarian move from the central government. Now, since the publication of the white paper uh, in the middle of 2014, conservative nationalists uh, from the Beijing side have heavily shaped the policy towards Hong Kong. And of course, they have the security concern. And similarly, since the anti-national education campaign in Hong Kong in the summer of 2012, the Hong Kong ideological factions have shifted to the dominance of the confrontational localists. The whole political spectrum has squeezed the political space for the political moderates, especially the liberal localists. So the political space uh, has become narrowed. And the conservative nationalists on the Beijing side dominated the central government's policy towards Hong Kong since 2014, stressing one country over two systems. And with the emergence of the Occupy Central movement in September to December 2014, the Hong Kong political spectrum was dominated by the confrontational localists therefore marginalizing the moderate element. So the situation uh, was very different compared to 2010. Some confrontational localists were even involved in the early 2016 Mong Kok riots. And the political moderates, especially the liberal localists, became a minority in dispute over the 2015 political reform. Uh, so we saw the political reform proposal unfortunately rejected in June 2015. And middlemen were also lacking in the 2014 to 15 political reform disputes and the vote. Uh, and in the 2015 political reform controversy, the liberal localists were driven to adopt a more confrontational stance. So the political spectrum moved to both the extreme uh, end, if you like. 
In the 2015 political reform model's rejection, the pro-government nationalistic localists were fragmented, having only eight members supporting the proposal in the Legislative Council. So even among the nationalistic localists, they were not really united. So the entire situation in Hong Kong was quite politically fragmented. So what is the way out uh, from the current political deadlock? Uh, ideally, um, this political spectrum should be uh, de-ideologicalized, but of course uh, this is very difficult. And uh, the formation of the new government may provide a window of, of, of opportunity because they try to embrace uh, a few liberal localists uh, into the government leadership. They are now welcoming more young people to join the government committees. The Marxist, confrontational and separatist localists have been adopting a low profile. Of course, we will have to see the situation further in the coming uh, by election for the Legislative Council. Um, so the confrontational and the separatist localists have also become less popular than before and there seems to be uh, an atmosphere of political pragmatism. So if, if this is uh, accurate, then uh, all sides may engage in some sort of political learning, and the government is now focusing on livelihood issues, so there seems to be a calmer social political atmosphere, at least uh, in the meantime. Hopefully there will be political dialogue in the future. So here I come up with a diagram showing Beijing's interactions with Hong Kong. Uh, you can see the Liaison Office, Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, PLA, basically MFA and PLA do not really interfere with Hong Kong affairs. Uh, the two bodies uh, more active uh, are the Liaison Office and the Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office. And there's also the Standing Committee of the NPC, CPPCC, uh, with some middlemen, and then uh, it also the NPC Standing Committee's decision also to some extent may in influence the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. Um, and here you can see the public opinion from interest groups, mass media, citizens, they are interacting with uh, the government and also the liaison office and Hong Kong MAO, they try to influence public opinion. For the international and external actors, uh, the role of the United States, UK, EU, Taiwan, international human rights groups, they are also at play uh, in this uh, diagram. Now, so what is the conclusion here? Ideological factionalism has characterized Beijing-Hong Kong relations since the middle of 2014, leading to the first confrontation in the rejection of the political reform proposal in June 2015 and secondly, the 2016 Mong Kok riot. So ideologies and factionalism persist. And the third confrontation accumulated in the November 2016 Standing Committee of the NPC Interpretation of the Basic Law. And if politics is the art of the possible, then a gradual return to a calmer political atmosphere conducive to dialogue and negotiation would be possible. Not necessarily now, but perhaps uh, later in 2019 to 2020, uh, when the issue of political reform may be discussed again. After all, Hong Kong's political reform from the early to 1990s to the current period actually adopted an incremental or step-by-step -step graduate approach, which will surely continue in the coming decades. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm relatively optimistic uh, in my assessment of Hong Kong. So my conclusion is that despite uh, all this ideological confrontation and factionalism, uh, Hong Kong will gradually return to normal and hopefully there will be a more gradual uh, approach uh, to political reform uh, in the coming years. So that's my conclusion. Thank you. 17 minutes, perfect. Okay, very good. <laughs> Uh, so the next speaker, there's a, a small change of the program. The next speaker is Professor Benny Tai, HKU. Uh, the title is Stages of the Democratic Movement in Hong Kong. Benny Tai is Associate Professor of Law at the University of Hong Kong. He is most known for initiating the Occupy Central, 
with Love and Peace Campaign, a movement to advance universal suffrage to directly elect the HKSAR chief executive in 2017. His major research areas include legal culture and the rule of law, comparative constitutional law, law and governance. He now leads the rule of law education project at HKU actively promoting the understanding of the rule of law in schools and in the local community. Thank you. Um, actually, every time I have the chance to speak as uh, academic, I enjoy very much. Um, because in the past few years, uh, kind of uh, my role as academic or and as role as a uh, social activist, uh, very often people kind of get confusing, and even sometimes I got myself confusing. But uh, in this uh, presentation, actually I will use an approach suggested by uh, academic, but also he was an activist in social movement, Bill Moyer. Uh, he was a co-worker of Martin Luther King in the uh, organizing the civil rights movement, and he actively participated in uh, several other uh, leading uh, social movements in the US and also in other parts of the world. And he suggested a model to look at social movements. And uh, seeing that the social movements uh, can be understood from uh, different stages, and I find his work very inspiring, especially that uh, he might be having the same kind of problem that I have, or maybe I, have, I may have the same kind of problem that he had, that the being academic as well as an activist. And so his uh, approach is to look at the social movement according to different stages. And I try to put it and apply it to the democratic movement of Hong Kong. And I find it interesting to see the um, the democratic movement of Hong Kong as different stages um, provide some kind of uh, insights to understand the democratic movement, especially as uh, we'll talk more about that uh, uh, during the umbrella movement. Uh, some people hope that they could reach the goal by just one action. I think they, if they could have the chance to read Bill Moyer's work, I think they would understand that actually we need much more time and actually there are different stages in the democratic movement before we can reach our ultimate goal. But surely I would not be applying his work mechanically because um, his work in applying to the Hong Kong context because of the unique situation of Hong Kong. Hong Kong is not a sovereign state and uh, we have a very powerful sovereign. That may make the uh, application uh, I have to modify his application, and I'll, I'll talk about that in greater details later. So I'll start with uh, his so-called stage one. That a stage one situation is called seeming normal, that even though the society might have a lot of injustice, but um, the social discourse of the society explain that everything seems to be good and normal, and no one questioned the injustice of the system. And I, I think uh, Mao will be talking about the value changes in Hong Kong later, that uh, this line rock, and we always uh, said this, uh, the line rock spirit of Hong Kong actually is the, is the major social and political discourse still might be influencing uh, uh, the older generations of Hong Kong people. Actually put it in a very simple way, to make money as much as possible in the shortest time so that you can uh, improve the economic well-being of your family. That's the Lion Rock spirit. I think that's still affecting a lot of, uh, or kind of shaping a lot of uh, Hong Kong people's thinking. So everything seems to be normal, even though I think in the 60s, 70s, a lot of injustice, but it seems to the, the social discourse provide explanation of the society and people just accept. But Actually, in the, actually, I think the stages are not kind of watertightly divided. They are kind of overlapping. We can also see in the 60s and 70s started that people talk about the injustice of society, but only be limited to a very small group of people. Now, this, the far end, that gentleman with the long hair, okay, rather long hair, actually should be long hair, actually. He was long hair. <laughs> that at a very young age of long hair, Lo Kok Hong. 
So that was the time that they started to talk about the injustice of the society. In the 60s and 70s, people in Hong Kong started, but only limits to a very small group of uh, people in the society. So I get the first stage, few stages uh, quickly. So actually, the time is flying very fast. Then in stage three will be the ripening conditions for the uh, democratic development to uh, kind of really uh, develop. Actually, you can say that starting from the 80s till the, uh, um, the, uh, after the transfer of sovereignty, we are kind of at a stage of the ripening conditions. And I use this photo, it's the 203, the uh, half a million people march uh, uh, in Hong Kong um, demonstrating against the Article 23 legislation. And after that, I think a stronger and stronger demands for democratic change in Hong Kong appear. Now, again, in the past, the demand for democracy may only be limited to a rather small group of people. I could still remember that when I was a student at the University of Hong Kong in the mid-80s, and I would uh, also participate, I started to participate in the democratic movement in Hong Kong at that time. We did organize a public procession, uh, kind of uh, asking for the uh, uh, direct election of the Lesser Council, uh, in 1988, and uh, in that public procession, around 700 people participate, and actually we call that a success at that time, with only that number of people participating, but you can see that now, if we are organizing any public procession with that number, that would be called a failure rather than a success. So the situation started to change. So the stage four, Bill Moyer called it a ticking off stage, that a very big social event that actually really take the movement uh, start. Actually, it's a ticking off. I think we can see the umbrella or the Occupy was the ticking off event. This event put everyone to attention of the needs of the demands of the democracy. But uh, as it's only the ticking off stage, no one can, uh, I think we, if we can understand that the democratic movement is a kind of a stages of development, then we can really uh, see that the taking off stage will not be the final stage. The taking off is just the beginning of the, demo the real beginning of the democratic movement. Now, Bill Moyer actually observed many social movements and uh, find that this uh, the, the stage five, which actually is a quite unnecessary stage, but happened very often, is the losing heart stage. As a lot of people participate actively in the in the ticking off event, but could not achieve the goal. So the, a lot of people will feel frustrated. And even that, uh, um, I would disagree with uh, Professor Lowe's uh, kind of uh, categorization of confrontational uh, um, localists. And, and if, you put, if you have not put my photo under that category, I would agree, but and, uh, because because that's a fine, very good, I think that's a significant distinction. Even we are confrontational um, um, uh, localists, that kind of a dis difference between the non-violence uh, 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 advocates and uh, violence advocates, and now the strategy and also the principles are quite different. And the losing heart stage that because the non-violence action could not achieve the goal immediately, so some of the people in the democratic camp may move to use violence. So that's the, and also got frustrated. But uh, as uh, we can learn from the model, that actually is totally unnecessary to get into this stage. But I can must admit that even at some point of time after the Occupy, I fall into this stage too, that uh, I got the time of feeling frustrated about what we can do uh, in advancing the democratic development of Hong Kong. Now, I will talk, use more time to talk about the stage six, and I believe that this is the stage that Hong Kong is now uh, in, is the, uh, uh, the winning the majority. Now, I think Martin has already mentioned that uh, throughout the years, the democratic camp uh, managed to, in, in all the elections, uh, I mean the lesser council elections, if you count the votes together, we got always, we have more than 50% of the votes. So the majority of the Hong Kong people, even after, especially if you look at the election results in 2016, after the umbrella movement, 
that we still got uh, 57 percent. If you count all the all the uh, uh, Democratic camp candidates lists, including the localists, together, around 57 percent of the votes. So we got the majority. We already got a majority. But in a democratic movement, if you want to use nonviolence, that will not be sufficient. You need to have an even stronger majority, maybe up to 60 to 70 percent. So this stage is that we have to build up an even stronger support in the community for democracy. So these are different ways we may need to, uh, or methods we may need to use in order to uh, build up the, a, a even bigger majority support in the uh, community. And I will, that's why I would insist that even if you want to classify me as a confrontational localist, I will insist that you have to further subcategorize of uh, nonviolence and violence. And uh, I think civil disobedience and nonviolence will still be the method we can uh, get more support of democracy in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, to, another thing is to uh, construct a new social and political discourse in the community. So I use another photo. This is the time that we have the big banner hanging on the line rock. You may call it the new line rock spirit and to counteract the line rock spirit. And the big banner is that we want genuine democracy. So that's the kind of a new social political discourse. And we might have to uh, enrich it further that what actually we want through democracy. And I think it's not just to have a democratic system, but what we will be able to get out of a democratic system. Uh, the, I think it's important to let uh, the general public to know that we may be able to have a better Hong Kong uh, in, uh, 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 through such a system. Um, the way of, uh, the, as, uh, uh, I think I agree that we have different ca uh, uh, groups in the democratic camp, but the organizational uh, uh, kind of structure will have to be different rather than be having an umbrella organization co covering all the other, all the groups, maybe we need to build up a kind of networks or coalitions among the democratic camp groups. And um, that's also what we can do, and some uh, scholars call that parallel institutions. That uh, the, the, I think in the discussions uh, of uh, yesterday night and also this morning, we can see that we have a very uh, robust uh, civil society in Hong Kong. And the way we can continue to build up the, the democratic movement is to establish uh, our own democratic processes in the civil society. And uh, that's uh, like we can organize unofficial elections, unofficial referendum in a way for people to express their views. And uh, also uh, learning from uh, Professor Larry Diamond's work on hybrid uh, uh, systems, that uh, that's a way to find breakthrough is to organize uh, the strategic voting election campaigns, how to organize that. I think that's the work we have done in the, in the 2016 election. And also important is to do more community work. And that might be the focus in the coming few years is to uh, look at the uh, district council elections. So now that seems to be uh, a lot of hope, but actually, as I mentioned, um, the Bill Moyers uh, uh, model cannot be mechanically applied to the case of Hong Kong. But it, because even if we can build up this uh, so-called absolute majority support in the community, we will not be able to get to the final stage. The five, uh, no, the, the stage seven. The stage seven is ripping success that, okay, that will be a final uh, action and final uh, uh, to, to get the results. Um, but because of the situation of Hong Kong, it's uh, very unlikely that uh, even if we can have got the support of the majority in Hong, uh, in Hong Kong, that China will not allow Hong Kong to have democracy, genuine democracy. So a lot of things will depend on what happened in China. So I'll just cite a few works, uh, uh, some of the works by some uh, China, very famous Chinese watchers like uh, David Shamborn's work on the, the China's future. Um, he talked about that China may be at a crossroads. So that's a different possibilities like uh, 
of the heart of authoritarianism, soft authoritarianism, semi-democracy, or new authoritarianism. I think the, 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 the perception now, China has moved it to the new authoritarianism. And um, he, 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 uh, uh, Dil Shambhan's work suggested that China might be facing this kind of changes. And uh, Professor Pei Minxin added one more possible uh, 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 way out is a revolution. That's a, there will be reform introduced by the uh, political elites in China and then leads to a revolution at the end. Now, that may also affect the situation of Hong Kong. I will also see that Hong Kong might also be at a crossroad now. That uh, following the four um, exits uh, suggested by David Shambon, that maybe Hong Kong will also have the four possible exits. One is that uh, one country, one system. If, uh, if China continue to pursue the new authoritarianism, that might be one country, one system may come to Hong Kong, or at least the one country may be much bigger than the two systems. And the one country, two systems, uh, the white paper version, emphasizing the comprehensive jurisdiction, now, if, we, if China is able to get into a, some kind of democratic reform, might be, or electoral reform, might, might be that Hong Kong will have a democratic autonomy. That's an autonomy that can really respect the democratic rights of Hong Kong people. And no, I don't know where, what, what will happen, or under what situation will happen, that independence. But this might be some kind of thinking uh, of Hong Kong people that they also we are facing at crossroads. So, Democracy in Hong Kong, um, as the two are so closely connected, um, would it be a goal can never be achieved unless there's a big change in China. But what will happen in China can never be decided or determined by Hong Kong people. And uh, we have, uh, I also categorize, uh, <laughs> and I categorize in a different way. I call them the two systemists who still believe in the basic law and hoping that through the basic law, they can get to the, a democratic Hong Kong. Um, so, but the, so Martin Shuley is a, the representative, but this role is now blocked. Now to the self-determinists like uh, Joshua Wong um, and his group, Demosisto, they want to have uh, a kind of process for Hong Kong people to decide our own future. So I call them the self-determinists. They may include independence into the options, but they may not personally support independence. So they, through that, they hope that we can have a democratic Hong Kong. But again, the road is blocked. And surely the independence like ever learn, hoping that through independence, we can have uh, a democratic Hong Kong. So I call them the independentists. But again, the road is blocked. So the division within the democratic camp among the two systemists self-determinists and independentists, I would say is insignificant at this point. Now, there may not be a big difference of what, what they ultimately want to achieve, the democratic Hong Kong. A Hong Kong people governing Hong Kong based on the Hong Kong core values. Um, but the, they, they differ only on the pathways, how to reach that. But up to this point, they are all blocked. So the democracy in Hong Kong is so near, but yet so far. And um, so that's the, I will continue to think that we need to uh, continue the civil resistance, and that's why I emphasize the nonviolence part. And in order to uh, continue this civil resistance, it's important to have civil resilience that we have to uh, continue. And uh, so as we cannot reach the stage seven, actually that's not much do we need to talk about the stage eight. That's if after, uh, according to Bill Warren's model, is the consolidating the uh, achievement. But I would just modify it that the stage A in the case of Hong Kong is to continue the struggle. That uh, even though we may not be able to see the, uh, the, the end yet, but I think the process of building up the democratic culture in Hong Kong, maybe in the long run, we will be able to change not just Hong Kong, but also China. I think this point has been mentioned that the, the, the crossroad that uh, China may be influencing the Hong Kong's development, but maybe also the Hong Kong's development in some way 
may also affect the development in China. I think this has been mentioned by Ching Cheng or the others that uh, for, for, for looking at the history of Hong Kong, that Hong Kong has always been the place where new ideas are uh, being incubated. So Hong Kong can be the incubation ground for the change of China in the future. And uh, it may also be the shelter for a lot of uh, dissidents. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's still good that we have the, some kind of protection of human rights in Hong Kong, so we can still have the freedoms. And uh, that's why I can still come here to uh, Stanford to talk. Uh, and so it provides a kind of shelter to dissidents. And uh, might be, I don't know how, but uh, it can be appreciated for change in China. So that's the, um, maybe that uh, in, in, in doing our own democracy, maybe we're not talking about any democratic change directly in China, but just doing the democracy in Hong Kong, just doing the democracy, working hard to build up this democratic culture, maybe in the long run, we may be able to bring change in China too. Thank you. Uh, the, third, the third speaker is Professor Okma C-U-H-K. His title is Value Changes, Trust and Performance in Post Handover Hong Kong. Mark Ong is Associate Professor at the Government and Public Administration Department, Chinese University of Hong Kong. With a PhD from UCLA, his research area include party politics and elections, democrat democratizations, state society relations, value changes, and social movements in Hong Kong. He has published five books, more than 20 journal articles, and more than 20 book chapters on Hong Kong politics. Professor. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually changed my topic because uh, as originally advertised uh, when, when the advertisements were sent out, I was supposed to talk about party development or underdevelopment. Uh, but I found that pretty boring. And uh, partly because I, I don't see too many significant changes in the last 10 or 15 years, uh, with the exception that it has gone further downhill in terms of un underdevelopment. So I uh, actually changed the topic. Uh, to value changes and then uh, partly because I can provide empirical data to show some of the changes that cover a period of 20 years after the handover. The other is that I also try to put it in a kind of a, a perspective that helped you to understand recent changes and also how, how the people of Hong Kong think. So the starting point is a kind of a traditional view in understanding Hong Kong politics because uh, traditionally a lot of people, uh, early scholars like Lao Siu Gai, uh, actually understands Hong Kong politics by a kind of political cultural explanation that uh, Hong Kong people, Hong Kong Chinese, were seen as uh, politically apathetic uh, with a kind of a refugee mentality. They were refugees from the mainland and also materialistic. They only care about making money, just as many what, what just said. And then uh, Hong Kong's view on democracy was classified as kind of a partial vision, which is uh, an insufficient understanding of democracy or a very instrumental understanding of democracy. And then uh, or attentive spectators in the sense that Hong Kong people pay attention to politics, but they did not participate. Uh, they did not participate because that they think that it is useless. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, repeated opinion surveys show that people think that the government would not listen to them. And, then, uh, and that this ha is the dominant explanation to explain the low level of political participation of Hong Kong people in the colonial times. And the major explanation was two. One is the Hong Kong people has had low political advocacy in the sense that they did not believe that if they participate, it is going to make a difference. This is one thing. The second is kind of a performance legitimacy argument that uh, Hong Kong government has been doing fine. Doing fine in the sense that they have been 
turning out good economic performance, has a relatively clean bureaucracy, and then also has the rule of law, rights are re well protected, so, so people are happy, are content with this, uh, with this uh, situation. But the trends of the last 10 years, I would say, show significant changes in terms of political values in Hong Kong. Uh, although we, we st so this is one thing that I'm going to uh, present to you today, which I do by uh, presenting from results of the Asian Barometer Surveys. Uh, if I may introduce Asian Barometer Surveys, of course, uh, Larry knows much better than I do. We, uh, it is started from 2000, the year 2000. It is uh, now covers 14 plus one. Uh, the, the plus one is Australia, so that's why I plus one here. Uh, Asian states uh, and regions, which uh, we had completed four wave, four full waves of surveys, and then uh, all over these uh, 15 uh, uh, states. And then the in, in important part is that we use the same core questionnaire in every place. Uh, now in wave four, the core questionnaire is something like 180 questions, uh, which we ask in every place, at, at mostly in every wave. And then that allows us to compare over time and also allow us to compare over uh, uh, across different countries. And then uh, these are mostly questions on democratic attitudes, political attitudes, government evaluation, including economic evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. So, we had completed four waves of Asian Barometer surveys, which corresponded, actually, interestingly, to four different periods of time in Hong Kong's post-1997 development. Wave one is 2001, which I believe is when Hong Kong was hard hit by the Asian financial crisis. And then Mr. Tong was, I think, at one of his lowest apps of his uh, popularity. This is one. The year 2007 is the second wave which, uh, as uh, Mr. Zhang mentioned this morning, it is, I would say, the high point of the government's popularity. And that was uh, a, a very important sense of optimism in, uh, at that time, I think 2007, everything uh, showing a very high uh, uh, popularity ratings. Wave 3 is the start of the uh, CY Leung's uh, term, and Wave 4 is early 2016. So the difference between 2012 and 2016 should allow us to actually compare uh, uh, and ascertain the uh, effects of the umbrella movement in terms of uh, its impacts on political attitudes in Hong Kong. So uh, you may expect that I don't have time to actually tell you about all the results in more, over 180 questions. And then what I would try to do is to highlight some of the major changes uh, uh, especially the changes in wave three and wave four uh, that allow me to uh, tell you a little bit about recent uh, value changes. And then uh, some of them actually are pretty stable over time, uh, which means that uh, I, I'm not going to report it, but I'm going to uh, tell you some of the more eye-catching uh, changes uh, in recent years. The first thing is regime legitimacy evaluation. We have several set questions on uh, to test this how they evaluate the regime. Uh, those who are uh, do, those who can read Chinese can read the original questionnaire question. Uh, this is, are you proud of our system of government? So we can see that it is kind of evenly split, half proud, half not proud. The second is uh, our systems like ours, even if it runs into problems, problems deserve the people's support. Again, it is kind of split. Uh, uh, but kind of stable over wave three and wave four, and then uh, I, our system, I wanted to live under our system. It is kind of split, but still it is uh, positive uh, in in terms. But if we look at it uh, from a cross national perspective, if we compare to other Asian states, uh, this is not very bad. The 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 blue bar represents the the uh, uh, the percentage that is agree or second, uh, strongly agree. And Hong Kong is actually third last in terms of a percentage of agreement, but we are still doing better than Korea and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And then second is, uh, is it worthy of support? Again, uh, last three in Asia. And then um, uh, I prefer to live under our system, again, last third in, in, in Asia. 
So this is the first thing that we do not have a very high evaluation of our current system of government. This is one thing. The most eye-catching change in 2016 wave is institutional trust. Uh, do you have trust in the various political institutions of Hong Kong? And I can only show you the graph and you can see everything goes down. And I would put that down as a kind of a significant impact on political attitudes in, uh, on Hong Kong's uh, political attitudes uh, by the umbrella movement. And the courts used to enjoy very high, uh, it still enjoys the highest trust, but it, it is a significant drop uh, by something like 12%, I get if I remember correctly. And then, it, no, no, this is only early 2016 data. So that, this is before everything happened in this summer. So uh, I, I figure that if we do the test today, and this is going to go down another maybe 15, 20%, but you can see that all these like PRC government, civil service, P PLA, and then the legislative council, the CE, the police, the newspapers all go down by a range of 15 to 20 percent or something like more than 20 percent in a period of like three or four years and it is still Siwa Leung uh, serving as the uh, as the CE in, in, in that same period of time and then uh, evaluation of freedom the other uh, significant drop uh, indicator is uh, the evaluation of freedom these we have two questions uh, do you fe feel that uh, people are free to speak what they think without fear and then uh, if you look at uh, the difference between wave 3 and wave 4, then there is about more than 10% who said that they uh, not disagree with the statement that people can speak what they think without fear in Hong Kong. So this is a pretty good figure all over Asia compared to other states in Asia because Singapore has more than 40% disagreeing with that argument, uh, 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 statement. So, so Hong Kong is still high in that regard, but we, we kind of saw a kind of a decline, in, in, uh, especially if we compare wave three and wave four. Freedom association. And then you can see between wave three and wave four, there is almost a 15% increase in terms of people disagreeing that they can join any political association without being afraid, and then this is, I would say, a, a kind of a, a important a change in, in recent years. Evaluation on abuse and corruption, and this is one figure that is actually pretty good. Uh, that is, uh, uh, how often do you think government leaders break the law or abuse their power? Which is uh, sometimes figure or rarely figure is actually very high, which means that uh, if we look at these two figures, actually it is very low by Asian standards, actually one of the lowest in Asia. And then, uh, and then the corruption, do you think that it is, uh, it is corrupt? Again, this is a very good figure by Asian standards. And then uh, most officials are corrupt, about 15% or, or, or everyone is corrupt. This is a slight increase in recent years. But I'm going to show you the interesting part is the third slide. Do you think that the Hong Kong government is working hard to crack down on corruption. And then 22% uh, saying that this is doing its best, but it is a kind of a continuous drop in terms of confidence. But it is not doing much, it's 13%. Doing nothing is 3.45%, which means that there is a more and more people believing that the Hong Kong government is not doing enough or anything to tackle corruption. Again, this compared to other Asian states, Hong Kong is highest. Uh, uh, highest in terms of confidence, in terms of uh, government's uh, uh, ability to crack down on corruption. And the interesting thing is that we have another question, which is a, a, can, a kind of a standard question to test on corruption. That is, do you, uh, do you actually, your friends or your relatives, do, do they actually experience corruption? Like the government officials taking money. And more than 90% said that they did not have relatives or, or, or friends had that experience. So this is a kind of an impression thing that is by their life experiences, Hong Kong is a, still a very clean place. But the perception that the, the government, is, are, they, are they really serious about corruption? Actually, they, the confidence is kind of declined in recent years. Okay, 
value changes. I'm not going to burden you with a lot of the multivariate analysis, so I'm going just to very briefly simply uh, report the uh, percentages. Political advocacy. Uh, do Hong Kong people believe that they can affect politics? And then we have several questions that stand the questions to test these all over the countries. Uh, I think I have the ability to participate in politics. If you look at the agree figure, this is a steady increase. Steady increase. But again, this is still the lowest in Asia in terms of uh, people believing think, think that they have the, the ability to increase in part, uh, to participate in politics. Uh, the second testing question is sometimes politics and government is very complicated, I can't understand. And then this is disagree percentage, which means people who think that they can actually understand and participate in politics kind of very significantly increase over four waves. So from, it is something like 15% in wave one, after 15 years, it is something like close to 40%. This is pretty significant change, I would say, in terms of political values. Support for democracy. We have a large number of questions uh, testing about people's support for democracy as an ideal, as a government form, as uh, on different values. Uh, I don't have time to present every one of them. Uh, uh, but uh, on average, I think Hong Kong people's support for democratic values if we test about equality, uh, pluralism, freedom of speech, etc., check and balances, etc., it is kind of a middle high range in all of Asia. Usually it is lower than the support level in Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And then uh, these I call the uh, new Asian uh, democratic countries. And then usually we are higher than the support levels of other. Uh, less economically developed countries, actually. So uh, I'm sure going to show you a couple of these. Uh, democracy is always preferable uh, as a form of government. So we are middle of the pack, not very high. Uh, uh, democracy may have its problem, but it's still the best form of government. Again, we are middle of the pack. And then uh, the last section that I'm going to talk about is about national identity and loyalty, which is a kind of a, a touchy issue in these days. Uh, I don't have the Robert Chong question that uh, what do you, uh, do you identify yourself with uh, as a Chinese or Hong Kongese? But uh, we have several questions which actually we did that uh, all over uh, Asia. That is for the sake of national interest. Individual interest can be sacrificed. And over the years, Again, you can see, uh, agreeing that you can sacrifice individual interest in favor of national interest dropped from something like 45% to now is only about slightly over 32%. So that, that means that the so-called national loyalty uh, factor is going to have more and more, less and less influence on people. And then if we look at it, okay, across Asia, it is interesting. Hong Kong's support level is second lowest in terms of in favor of sacrificing your individual interests compared uh, in favor of national interests. The interesting thing is that the lowest one is Japan. We always think Japan as a kind of a nationalistic uh, military, militarism country, but Japan has the lowest. Uh, the second thing, a citizen, uh, uh, you can read the Chinese actually, uh, even if uh, because the, the English is a shortened version, even if the, the government does something wrong, the, a citizen should also always remain loyal only to his country. This is even more eye catching in terms of the drops. Uh, the, and then for this adds up to 53% disagreeing that you should only be loyal to your own country. And we look at it across Asia, Hong Kong is third lowest. Surprisingly, only higher than Japan and Korea. And we always perceive Korea as a very nationalistic, patriotic nation. But that is not true, at least from our data, that people believe that Korean people do not actually believe that they, they, they need to own, be only loyal to their own country. OK, this it comes to the sensitive part. Uh, how proud are you? So this is, as you can see from the figures, this is kind of a significant drop by something like 20 plus percent. 
in in a period of uh, like ten years. Uh, as actually uh, as a teacher who get in touch with young people every day in school, I'm kind of surprised by this figure. I, I still consider it pretty hard. <laughs> and then, and then uh, among young people, especially, and then uh, not proud at all, and uh, not very proud about thirty percent. So uh, this is uh, actually. Um, I will go back to this uh, if I have time, but my conclusion uh, in going over all these is that there are several things. Hong Kong people slowly getting become more advocates in the sense that they believe that they can understand better politics, participate in politics, kind of make a difference, but it is still the lowest in Asia in terms of political advocacy, but it is slowly growing and consistently growing over the last 10 or 15 years. The second thing is the support for democracy in terms of by various counts actually uh, is very much comparable to Asia as I said in the kind of a medium high uh, level uh, in, uh, if I compare it to other Asian states. So, uh, so it is actually we have a reasonably uh, resilient support for democracy. And then, um, but in the last five years or so, we saw a kind of a significant decline in various institute in the confidence in various institutions, including the court, the police, the civil service, the executive departments, and then uh, also maybe other uh, other things, and also in terms of personal freedom or political freedom, and then uh, the and regime legitimacy a slight decline, not actually very bad, especially if you, we compare it uh, to other, but uh, other substan substantive evaluations are pretty okay in terms of equality, in terms of uh, uh, government's ability to deliver services, etc. So th those are still pretty okay, pretty stable over time. But the last thing is that, uh, last but not least, is that uh, the, the weaker, there is a weaker national identity and the weaker appeal of national loyalty. And I can see that as in line with a kind of a global trend of uh, especially young people getting more self assertive and then more uh, in love of freedom and autonomy and then they don't want to be represented by other people, they want to take to direct action and then they are kind of uh, uh, unhappy about top-down directives from the government, uh, from even hier hierarchies from above, etc. So one thing that I have been saying for some time in recent years is that I can see the value gap in Hong Kong between especially the young people and the uh, Chinese government be, uh, become wider and wider. And I have always seen the value gap, the gap in political values as a kind of a major contradiction in under one country two systems. And then uh, the original thinking was that the gap will get narrower over time in a period of like 15 or 20 years because of integration, because of interaction, etc. But uh, in the last five or 10 years, I think that the gap is getting wider and wider. The younger people of Hong Kong, or even most people in Hong Kong, are under the globalized influence in terms of political values. And then they are more form of freedom, autonomy, you don't mess with me. And then the, but I would say from what I see every day, the, the government's uh, uh, main tone or governing philosophy, uh, the rhetoric, including what you heard this morning uh, from Professor Wang, actually the, the, the words that they chose, I would, say have very, I would say have very little appeal to the young people. You're still talking about stability, economic growth, about everything else, about nationalism, about uh, uh, harmony, a lot of these things which in like Western societies have very little appeal to the young people, to the young and more educated people. And I would say this, especially with the lack of growth of democracy, uh, this widening uh, value gap is going to trouble uh, Hong Kong for some time to come with their major institutional reforms. So, I, my time is up, so I'm going to stop it. Now the floor is open for questions.
Yes, please. Yeah. Sorry, I have time to play here. Is there a similar gap between the values of young people and the government in China as a whole? And can you even measure that? You could answer the question in the broad sense of China to me include Hong Kong as I'm a province of Taiwan province. Okay. Uh, I do we answer every yeah, question yeah, yeah, one yeah, by one? Yeah, also, yeah, okay. okay. Uh, I don't have the China data on my hand, but I maybe I don't know if Larry has the impression uh, about the, the, the China's uh, data situation. But the general, uh, if I follow Engelhardt and Welso's uh, 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 track, actually they would argue that even in autocratic societies, actually the generational gap is very big. Uh, the young people show a lot of uh, um, support, higher support for like values like autonomy, equality, or what they call self-expressive values. And then uh, we do not have data in Macau. Actually, we did, did the, the, the fifteen cases did not uh, include Macau. But I think it is very obvious in in other states. Actually, um, one of the major factors which explain the value differences is age. And, and education. And age also, in, in many of these societies, age actually overlaps with education. Uh, the younger people have better education. So, so actually, this is uh, one thing. But I think the, 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 the situation in China is different because uh, they, the, the political system doesn't al allow them to express that kind of uh, opinion very openly or safely. So, so I think the, the, the expression is kind of different. But I think the, the, my concern is that actually uh, in recent couple of years, I can sense that the uh, official, uh, the official uh, uh, line of the Hong Kong government is getting more and more influenced by the Chinese uh, philosophy, the, the Chinese governing philosophy in terms of the words they chose, the rhetoric they use, the values they, that they contain, which I would say did not appeal to uh, the uh, Hong Kong, especially young people, very much. Oh, the mic. Oh. Um, the American uh, opinion poll uh, institution, the Pew always return a consistently high um, approval rate of the Chinese people for their system and their leadership. How does your study uh, differ from, from, from theirs? And, and do we have data for uh, the Chinese uh, situation? You mean the it, mainland China? Yeah. I don't have the China, fact, the China data with me. I don't know if Larry can eliminate with, with that. So I'm not responsible for the China's, uh, mainland China's uh, survey. But uh, uh, I can only answer for the Hong Kong part. Yeah, so sorry. Yes, please. Uh, it's, um, as two very different uh, similar cities, can you uh, compare and contrast some of the key differences between your survey findings on Singapore and Hong Kong? Mm -hmm. Very interesting. People keep asking me about areas outside Hong Kong, <laughs> <laughs> which I do not. I admit that I do not study the data in in different parts uh, well enough. But I think uh, Singapore, on the whole, shows very good uh, trust and um, legitimacy or support for their own system of government. And and then uh, and then, but I always have some skepticism about the quality of the Hong, uh, Singapore data. It is because that question, since way free, I observed that more than forty percent of Singapore people said that they 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 don't feel safe expressing their political opinion in the public. <laughs> if you don't feel safe, how can I know that the survey results are sincere? And then, uh, but. That is how we conduct our surveys, but, but I would say that in general, the, the difference is that 
we can observe actually in a lot of these uh, autocratic countries, not, not totally like pe uh, countries like Vietnam, uh, people can be very confident of their own system, very proud of their own system. Actually, pe uh, the, the, the countries that show the least support or least satisfaction with their own system are the more democratic ones, Taiwan and Korea. And that is what I would put down as a kind of a critical citizen, so-called critical citizen situation. That is, they, they harbor democratic values. But they are unhappy about their government performance in the sense that the government is democratically elected government is not living up to democratic standards. So they are unhappy. So they are unhappy about the, the performance of the government and also the so-called system of government. But in a lot of the less democratic countries, actually, uh, they can be pretty happy about what they are getting. But Hong Kong is different in the sense that Hong Kong, we always said that Hong Kong is a kind of a liberal autocracy. Liberal autocracy in the sense that there are very few states in the world which you do not allow people to elect their own leaders, but you allow them through freedom to criticize their leaders. <laughs> this is one thing that I wrote 10 years ago in my book. And then it is very, very special. And uh, most of long democratic states do not allow people like Robert Chung to publish uh, posts showing the low popularity of the government every month. They don't. And then people can be very happy because they don't know that people hate the government. And then, so, so that, that can be... Uh, but Hong Kong is paradoxical in the sense that, as I said, Hong Kong people can go to the streets uh, to show their dissatisfaction against the government. They can criticize in the media. They can do this. They can do that. But the only thing they, that they cannot, cannot do since CH Tong to Zy Leung is that they cannot replace the unpopular government by through the ballot box. <laughs> so, so this is kind of a kind of a very paradoxical situation that, uh, on the one hand, we find uh, kind of our dissatisfaction vented by the freedom of speech, freedom of expression in Hong Kong. So it is less depressing. But the, the, sec the, the second side of looking at things is that we all know that this system is not good and then we are unhappy about the system, but we cannot change that. And then this is a, a kind of a, a depressing uh, a, a situation which induces a lot of helplessness, I guess, in re recently, in, in, uh, as we observe every day in Hong Kong society, that, that people keep asking themselves, what can we do, what can we do, what can we do? And the, the answer is actually not much, despite uh, Benny talking a lot about civil resistance, etc. And then uh, when people ask, is that useful? Does, could that make a difference? It is actually a very difficult question to answer. Uh, uh, and I would put that down as part of the reason why Hong Kong's political advocacy remains low. Because you cannot very effectively show to the people that they can actually make changes through their political participation. The 2003 July 1st is a very important example that after that, people believe that when I go onto the streets, I actually stop the national security legislation. Then after that, it was a very major empowerment exercise. We, we all know that we, we, after we, that we did research, a lot of people who did research think that that is that, that brings forward a, a, a crop of activists as a new generation. But we cannot say the same maybe for the umbrella movement because it induces a lot of happiness, uh, a sense of failure, because they, a lot of people believe that that movement failed. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. So as many times, like, Professor Benny Tai, like, in your presentation, you, like, I mentioned, like, there's three ways, for example, like, two countries or, like, a self-determination, or even, like, um, the, um, the independentness, they yeah, like, it seems like their pathway is not working that well. So what would be your advice, or what would be your thinking that for Hong Kong's young students, or, like, young person, that they can do to achieve, to enhance Hong Kong democratic movements, like, the size of, like, those ideologies, or, like, are there any particular things that we can do? Um, well, actually, in the past uh, few months, I'm working very hard in building up uh, or getting the people to consider to participate in the coming district council elections. 
So I think the thing I would say that uh, uh, to go to the community. So it might be a bit, uh, I don't know how to say this, but just uh, that's the thing we, we can do and we should do. And it's difficult to be stopped. And uh, even though we can have the manipulation of the electoral laws to disqualify people, but if we have young people doing work in the community, advancing the democratic idea, the continue that kind of uh, cultural change, value change in the community. Um, I think in, in the long run, we'll get that absolute majority support in Hong Kong. Actually, even if we do not do anything following Mao's uh, study, actually just sit here. After 10 years, we'll get the absolute majority. Because the older generations... <laughs> well, I'm surely I will not... I, I, I think we will have to do a lot of things in order to maintain that, yeah. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your keynote uh, speeches. I just have two brief questions. Um, so uh, first is that uh, it's fair to say that in the past decade, Hong Kong has seen uh, a growing want for democracy and a dwindling sense of uh, national nationalist attachment to China. And what do you think China has to fear from um, the wave of democratization and uh, this kind of disintegration of the sense of identity. And the second question is, what will the future be like uh, in terms of fractionalism? Um, how will the divide between Hong Kong and Beijing look like um, in, say, a few years' time from now? From now? Thank you. Okay, let me answer your question first. Uh, now, the first uh, question is about uh, Beijing's concern uh, about Hong Kong. I think uh, Beijing is uh, definitely concerned about whether democracy or democratization in Hong Kong can bring about a Trojan horse scenario in which uh, Western or foreign states can really occupy this uh, Trojan horse and then uh, overturn or topple the political systems in both uh, Hong Kong and China. So I think uh, Beijing is still very concerned about foreign influence or foreign intervention in Hong Kong uh, system, especially when Hong Kong is going to become uh, a Western-style democracy. Uh, for your question about factionalism, I think uh, it will persist. The question is whether on the democratic side, factionalism will be more fragmented than before. It seems that in the past several years, uh, from Professor Benny Tai's categorization, I think uh, both uh, Professor Tai and I have consensus that the localists uh, have become far more fragmented than ever before. Uh, if the localists uh, are becoming increasingly fragmented, the challenge uh, of Beijing is how to engage the leaders of the localist uh, fragments and who are the leaders, whether they are be really the so-called leaders. And on the pro-democracy front, what will be the concerted effort and philosophy in dealing with democratization? Professor Benitai advocated uh, an approach in which the Democrats uh, should occupy the district councils first. Then the challenge is uh, whether at the grassroots level, the localists can train and groom themselves with sufficient candidates to compete in the district council elections. That will be a, a kind of immediate challenge. So that's my overall assessment. I may give a brief response. Uh, what does China fear? China fears nothing. Uh, either one, did you read the time? Uh, uh, so uh, actually, uh, I guess, but I can share with uh, Mr. Cheng Cheng's uh, comment this morning that uh, I think China is unhappy about the current developments, or, or Mr. Zhang's uh, comment this morning, China is not totally happy about the, the uh, uh, development of Hong Kong in terms of it seems that uh, uh, the current situation is a little bit getting out of hand, uh, despite uh, China's economy growing strongly. 
but uh, I don't think they see uh, democratization or significant political reforms as a kind of a way out to serve to solve the current problem, which is contradictory to what we political scientists would think. And then, uh, but I would say, judging from my uh, personal research and also the, the 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 data, I don't think like top down national education is going to cut it. Uh, because uh, I think Hong Kong is still a free city un unless you, as somebody said this morning, unless you, you block, or yesterday, uh, un unless you even block the internet. Uh, but that would mean uh, Hong the end of Hong Kong as a free city. But other than that, I don't see that they can re very effectively change the minds of especially the young people in terms of their uh, desire for autonomy and democracy and freedom. And then, uh, uh, so that, that would be the uh, like pessimist, pessimistic part on that. And, uh, but I do not believe, uh, one, one response, very brief response to, to Benny's point is that there's no reason to believe that the value change is linear, even in Hong Kong. Some processes are linear, like technology, I guess. Uh, and, and then maybe the education, the, 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 because the younger people usually getting more gen, uh, education than their grandfathers, yet yeah, that, that will be linear, but there is no uh, reason to actually assume that there will be a kind of a linear growth in terms of support for democracy. Yes, please. Are the panelists could answer yeah, our garland, you are a media person, <laughs> <laughs> or even Cheng Chang, you were on both sides of the border as a journalist. <laughs> Well, I, I, I begin to feel fed up with dis discussing the issue of um, press freedom because I've been talking about this issue in the past 20 years without no avail. Now my concern is more with the gradual erosion of the rule of law, which uh, began to, to, to hit uh, the SAR since the publication of the white paper. So my concern now is more with this uh, gradual and systematic design to uh, change the law system in Hong Kong. So I, 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 if I have a chance, I would speak more on, on this. But I, I'm totally fed up with talking about press freedom because I've been <laughs> and alarm and, and, and signing alarms to alert people to this, to this uh, danger. No, okay. So, so I, I, I Well, uh, yesterday's uh, dinner, I, uh, Mr. Zhang mentioned that it's difficult to talk about 2047 because we are talking about 30 years later. And in a way, I agree with him that uh, it's difficult to talk about the democratic future of Hong Kong uh, in 2047. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, that uh, whether Hong Kong can have a democracy 
will be very much depends on the democrat uh, the, the political situation in China. And um, so in the coming 30 years, what will happen to China, I think even more difficult to make any prediction that what will happen to China. But uh, no matter what, if you follow David Shambon or many others, uh, China Watchers kind of uh, um, way of looking at China's future, that the totalitarian rule can continue and further, or there may be reform, or there may be even a collapse. But that's no one we can we can we we we, have, we we cannot have the crystal ball. We cannot tell. So the only thing I would say that uh, we should do is that uh, even though we may not be able to see how, but I think it's important that we continue to. Uh, I, I, I'm not saying that we are not doing anything. I think it's important to do, continue to do the work in the community, actually go back to the uh, grassroots level, to the base level, to uh, in education, civil, edu civil education, in the community work, to consolidate the, the value change that have been, uh, uh, you can, we can observe in the past 10 years, to consolidate that, the, that value change and even further. Uh, develop that to build up a democratic base for Hong Kong and this democratic base in Hong Kong and again I cannot tell how I just do not know how it will happen but it may be the democratic base of China because in the whole China the whole place other than Taiwan actually if you look at the, the, the democratic culture actually Hong Kong is comparable to Taiwan in the Chinese community so Hong Kong and Taiwan would be very important base for democratic development in China, if there is any future of democratic democracy in China. It, uh, I think Hong Kong will have a role. The last questioner used the word centralized. <laughs> Zhonghua usually gets translated into English as the middle kingdom. Uh, middle kingdom. kingdom. Yeah. But it might as well be central state or at least something like that. Is there something existential or essential about Chineseness that requires some priority for the central state? I mean, China is big. It isn't one homogenous hunk. There are about 30 provinces, about 300 prefectures, um, 3,000 counties, uh, I've got exactly 40,000 40, towns. Uh, then non-state units below counties, because that's the lowest state unit in the mainland, uh, 700,000 villages, uh, lots of families, and 1.4 billion individuals. And the families are really important. I remember and seeing in Hong Kong an advertisement actually for a campaign poster for the DAB, <laughs> uh, the party that Mr. Tong put, with a very interesting uh, question, um, uh, what, uh, uh, mail huo, it's interesting that Jia, which is actually the political unit, and it is a political unit, family, mm -hmm. that is smallest, also is highest prestige, and has the most Chinese characteristics, in very arguably, at least as much as the central state. What is democracy supposed to do? It's supposed to relate different levels of Zoom, if you will, or sizes of polity, to each other. The way of doing that is a very rough proxy. You take a vote by individuals, that's just one size. But that also represents businesses, associations, churches, all sorts of me medial universities, all sorts of medial groups to some extent. That's one thing that democracy is supposed to do. Is that inherently un-Chinese? Is the Zhongguo, that is the central state, that definition of it, more Chinese than Smaller units such as the Chia. Who is going to refer? I don't know what that is. We, we got to bring in Joseph Chen. We got to bring in Joseph Chen. But, but, well, I, I think some some uh, some scholars actually did several tests about um, what is, what do we mean, what do we mean by Chinese culture or what do we mean by Confucian culture. And then there are uh, tests uh, in, in other so-called Confucian states, including Japan, Korea, or, or, or Taiwan. And, and, and then, the, uh, of course, they, they have different views on, uh, views on uh, authority, for example. 
and then on paternalism, for example, and on family values, for example. But that doesn't make them uh, intermensurate with democratic values. Yeah. That's what I've got to say. And then, uh, and then, of course, the, the, the last three examples that I raised show that they can actually run a consolidated democracy pretty well. Not that everybody is happy, but people live in living in democracies do not necessarily live very happily <laughs> about the government, especially. So, so I, I do believe that uh, uh, there is no apparent reason why, say, a Chinese culture, uh, no matter how you define Chinese, uh, is incommensurate with uh, democratic values. Yeah, that's I, how I would put. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.